Hello, this is Bradley Grunner and Stu Yellen, and here with we're here with the Moss Macros Podcast, episode number 17, and today we have a special guest, Rick Collins. Rick is a lawyer, former competitive bodybuilder who's still training, and an actor. So Rick, could you tell us about yourself? How you doing, Brad? Stu, good to, good to see you guys. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm an attorney, and my practice is sort of where health and fitness meets law. Uh, particularly bodybuilding. So I've probably represented more bodybuilders and others on steroid charges, possession, trafficking, manufacture, uh, doping situations where people are are found or, or accused of using banned substances either because they're an athlete or because they're in a job that makes it um, a problem such as being a police officer or a firefighter. And I've got uh, a lot of dietary supplement uh, companies that uh, use the services of my law firm for regulatory needs. So sort of my practice is where health and fitness, particularly muscle, meets law. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's very catchy. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> That's pretty much it, you know, which is a dream for me because, as you said, uh, I come from a background in bodybuilding. So uh, I was a competitive bodybuilder. I've been in the gym culture since I was 17 years old. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are bodybuilders. I still have a little crew that trains, you know, five times a week. So, uh, so for me, I was able to sort of combine my, my vocation and my avocation, the things that I enjoy outside of being a lawyer with what I do as a lawyer. I love going to work. I love my job. I like my clients. I do a lot of criminal defense work. So it's kind of weird to say, hey, you know, I like my clients, but I do. (laughs) And and I feel good about them. I don't represent, you know, my firm represents a a number of other types of criminal accusations. But um, I personally don't, I'm not at a point where I have to represent um, people who steal from each other, people who rape or rob or murder. So all of my... Uh, criminal defense practice is dedicated to people who are involved in sort of the esoteric substances, whether it's steroids or growth hormone or contaminated vitamins or supplements or things along those lines. Yes, that sounds great. A very interesting position that you have, actually. A unique one as well. And uh, today, people, we're going to be discussing the ethical and legal implications of steroid use. So let's go over legality. Uh, What are the current U.S. policies for steroid use? What type of punishment do people face for steroid use, whether it's personal use or intent to sell? What is there a general sentence or consequence right, for those? Right. So actions? I'll give you I'll give you the short history lesson. So back in I guess the '70s and '80s, um, I think a lot of people in the bodybuilding culture looked at steroids as super vitamins. So there way there was really no um, vision of them as being in the controlled substance category like heroin or marijuana yes. or cocaine or narcotics or recreational drugs, things like that. So in 1990, the law changed. The federal law changed and took steroids and put them into the same act, the same statute or law that deals with heroin and cocaine and these other narcotics. And that was primarily because of reports of steroids in sports. There had been a number of reports that um, there were teen athletes and professional athletes who were using steroids to get an advantage over athletes who were not using them. And then in 1988, sort of the shot heard around the world was Ben Johnson's sole Olympics win, where he became the fastest man alive and then test positive for Winstrel. Yeah. And suddenly the Canadian sprinter had beaten the American. It was cheating. We got to do something about this. And so Congress held a lot of hearings and in 1990 reclassified steroids and made them into a controlled substance. And since then, many other states have done it. Almost every state has criminalized uh, steroids. In some states, the mere possession of any amount of steroids is a felony. One tablet, one vial. In other states, it's a misdemeanor unless there's a higher volume of steroids or if it's possessed with the intent to sell it. Under federal law, the punishment is up to 10 years in prison for steroid trafficking or distribution 
in reality, the steroid sentencing guidelines really affect what real life sentences are. And typically a person who's arrested for mere possession in many states is looking at maybe a probationary sentence uh, in some tougher states, maybe some prison time. Um, for trafficking in the federal courts, it really depends what kind of volume there is. I've represented people who've, I represented a guy a number of years ago who sold one vial of testosterone. I've represented people on very small level scales yeah. like that, gym sales and things like that. These days, more of my clients are people who are underground labs, who are people who are importing raw materials, raws from China in a powdered form, testosterone, nandrolone, other types of steroids, and then converting them in their kitchen uh, to a usable form, an injectable uh, oil-based steroid, cooking it in on cookie trays in their oven, mm -hmm. slapping a label on it, and selling it on Instagram <coughs> or over the internet. And in some cases, the volume can be fairly high. If you're dealing with that, you're looking at more substantial prison time. Obviously, if you have any kind of prior arrest, that makes, that's an aggravating factor that makes it more likely you'll get more time. Rick, uh, let me ask, how, how you know, you're, you're throwing out a lot of stuff here. Um, how does this compare um, to, let's say, other other types of illegal illegal drugs, you know, possessions, intent to distribute, things like that. I mean, how how do they look uh, at, at at steroids? You know, are they as bad as X, Y, and Z? Are they worse? Are they, you know, what is what's the well? It depends on whether it's state or federal. So, in the federal system, there are classifications, different schedules of controlled substances. Steroids are Schedule Three. So they're not treated as harshly as Schedule One, which, believe it or not, is marijuana, mm -hmm. uh, or Schedule Two, which is cocaine. Um, but they're treated more harshly than Schedule Four or Five. At the state level, where people get arrested, let's say, because they have a traffic stop and they've got some steroids in their car and the car maybe is impounded or there's an accident and the car is brought to an impound lot, it's searched by the police and the police find a quantity of steroids. Well, the way it's looked at typically will depend on the volume. Mm -hmm. So let's say the person had just, had come from the post office where he had picked up a package of let's say a thousand tablets of a particular low potency steroid like five milligram anabol tablets from Thailand and he's got a thousand of them there which for many guys might be sort of a stockpile for personal use for a period of time maybe a couple of years of personal use a police officer without much training in steroids can look at that as if it's a thousand tablets of ecstasy mm -hmm. based on a lack of real understanding of the usage patterns of bodybuilders. So now you've got a guy who's really a possessor, an individual personal user, who gets locked up on a possession with intent to distribute charge mm -hmm. based on a police officer who really has no experience to be making that assessment. And I see mm -hmm. that happen in real life. I've seen that happen many, many times. Right. Well, have you seen a difference in the policies here versus other countries? Are there other countries, let's say, even stricter or more lax about steroid use? I think the United States tends to be stricter on drugs generally than a lot of the rest of the world, um, most of it. Uh, Australia is pretty tough on steroids, but there are many countries where anabolic steroids are not treated as controlled substances. And so, for example, in England, um, and in Canada, mere possession is not looked at as a controlled substance violation. Importing it, it can be a crime. Uh, distributing it certainly is a crime, but uh, the mere possession isn't looked that way, at that way. So um, in Mexico and some other, Greece, uh, you can buy over the counter. In Thailand, you know, you can buy many steroids over the counter. Sometimes you have to go to a hospital and uh, type of pharmacy in a hospital to get certain injectable steroids. But um, I think just in general, the United States tends to be more uh, into a military style assault on drugs in general. And when Congress added steroids to the Controlled Substances Act, it basically unleashed the same sort of military-style uh, approach to enforcement. 
Well, that just brings up some uh, a different subtopic as well, and um, not to go off on a tangent. However, I think it relates is that when you say militant, uh, the term militant, it you know it immediately reminds me of the the term uh, war on drugs. And I first heard that term thirty years over. Th- like when I think I was eight years old, or I, I wasn't even a teenager. When President Nixon declared it, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm hearing of the, I, I'm 38 years old, and I remember hearing this for the majority of my life, and t- till this day, uh, there's a war on drugs. And like we've spoken about, you know, via our text messages to each other, or on Facebook or Instagram when we communicate, um, you know, is this worth unleashing a war on? Is there an effect? Is it, is it beneficial for us? I, I think you know where I'm trying to go with this, right? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, the, the more broad discussion of has the war on drugs been successful or a failure, mm-hmm. that's a controversial issue. There are yes. people who are going to say, you know, if we didn't have this militaristic approach to drugs, things would be even worse. There are others who look at the situation and say we've spent well over a trillion dollars at this point over the span of 40 years and drug usage patterns are really not that different than they were before and there are some who argue that the more you prohibit the use of something whether it was alcohol in the 1920s or drugs since the 1970s that you create more social problems by the prohibition than you would by sort of a harm reduction approach. For example, in with alcohol, you had the rise of Al Capone, organized crime moves in, um, legitimate product disappears, yes. um, so black market product takes over. People are making gin in their bathtubs and dying, and so prohibition was a huge failure when it came to alcohol. And there are those who say the same about drugs, recreational drugs, narcotics. With respect to steroids, and that that debate, I'm not sure we're going to get you know a, an answer to that. Right. People are going to have their opinions about that. Steroids kind of got lumped into that war on drugs. So you know, I, I think if you believe that the war on drugs is a is a great success and we need to do more of it, you're going to believe that the 1990 law and its successors are a good thing with steroid use. If you believe that steroid, that if you believe that the war on drugs has been a failure, a trillion dollar failure, then I think you're gonna say, well, if it didn't work for cocaine and heroin, why would you possibly think it would work for steroids? You know, it's really interesting, and I hadn't thought about this before. Um, you know, me and Brad make little notes, things we wanna talk about. And you talk about prohibition. You know, you, you, you make something illegal, People find a way, people find alternatives, people find, and you know, I'm thinking back, and I know, what was it, what, 1990, you said they, they're officially illegal. And I remember, I guess, what, mid, mid-90s, mid it was just like this this rise of pro-hormones, mm-hmm. pro-steroids, right. everyone trying just to, you know, I, I guess, find circumvent loopholes. loopholes, the letter of the law, right. you know, it's not illegal right now, but once it goes through first pass digestion, now it's a steroid in your body, yeah. and... I remember hearing all sorts of stories that, you know, these things were worse for you than if you actually took steroids. Well, the I guess the irony, I think, is that when you pass something called the Anabolic Steroid Control Act and think that you're actually controlling the market more, you're actually losing all control over the market because the market was controlled when it was legitimate, FDA approved mm-hmm. pharmaceuticals coming from large pharmaceutical companies and being distributed by doctors and mm-hmm. pharmacists, sometimes more liberally than it should have been, sure, but you know, under some level of supervision. Mm-hmm. Once you create a prohibitionist style atmosphere, there is no control. So what you then have is the rise of alternative sources of supply, because we all know basic economics. If there's demand, there's gonna be supply. So if you cut down on the supply of legitimate products, you're gonna inflate a black market. It's simple economics. And so you have the rise of things like pro-hormones, ways of trying to get around the law. If the 1990 law was never enacted, we never would have had a pro-hormone market because the 
there was no reason to evade a law that didn't exist. And the pro-hormone market, and then following that, as that began to be uh, enforced against, the rise of the SARMs market. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all expressions of that economic principle of demand and supply. Um, the fact that now the, the main products on the steroid market are underground lab products, some of which may be very well controlled and, and, and of great quality, some of which are of highly questionable purity uh, and quality, and people are injecting this into their bodies having purchased it over Instagram. So uh, has the law worked? Uh, has it made things safer or better? I'm not so sure it has. Has it gotten steroids out of sports, which was the main focus when Ben Johnson was this big Olympic gold medalist? Well, I think headlines would tell us that there's been more sports doping scandals since the law went into place than was ever the case before the law went into place. And I think that the majority of people who have been arrested and prosecuted under the law, certainly, and, and I probably have seen more than anybody else, were basically non-competitive athletes who were either using steroids for cosmetic purposes, basically to look better without a shirt on when they went to Cancun, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or were had graduated to making money out of it, being bodybuilders, being users, and then graduating to creating a product, marketing a product, selling a product, and trafficking in steroids to other like-minded people who were also cosmetic users themselves. That's some eye-opening information right there. So, as far as morality goes, do you do we do you consider the use of it cheating? You know, somebody asked me the other day, if you were asked the question, are steroids good or bad? What would you say? And to me, that question encapsulates everything that is wrong <laughs> with America in 2017 because we're sort of dumbing down every issue to one that has no context, no nuance. It's either good or bad. Is something good or is something bad? Are you for it or are you against it? Are you on the left or are you on the right? Where, where, and unless you polarize yourself and categorize yourself into a position, you, you, know, you've, you haven't sufficiently expressed your point. I don't think you can answer the question, are steroids good or bad? Are steroids cheating or not? Unless you put it into context. Mm -hmm. So are steroids good? They're great. Absolutely <laughs> fantastic <laughs> if you have the AIDS virus and are suffering from HIV wasting. Mm -hmm. If you are a hypogonadal man with low testosterone, suffering real world problems due to low testosterone. Um, are steroids bad? Absolutely. If you're a 15-year-old kid in your mother's basement who's ordering steroids from some who knows who on the internet and God knows what is in that bottle and you're just a kid who's barely started training and has no idea what you're doing and is going to take the advice in terms of dosages that you read by, from somebody on, on Facebook, no, they're terrible. So, you know, are steroids cheating? Well, certainly I think that if you are in a sport where you have essentially made a, a contract with the sports body that you are going to not do certain things and you do them, I think the moral relativism argument that, well, other people are doing it too so I can do it is not an excuse for the moral lapse. On the other hand, and that to me is the less interesting question, I think the more interesting question is whether the person who is not competing in sports, the person who is simply using steroids so that when he goes to the beach, he looks better to the other guys and girls on the beach, is that cheating? And is there something wrong with that, you know? Um, Somehow I think 
we've made the determination that it kind of is because um, we've essentially treated those people with the same criminal justice uh, hammer that we've treated the people who would be using it in sports. But it's, it's somewhat hypocritical, I guess, because we don't look at a lot of other things as cheating that are surgical, that are medical, that present risks, whether it's liposuction, breast implants, pec implants, calf implants, you know, Botox. I mean, there's a million ways that we cheat nature uh, in order to achieve some level of vanity yes. in a vain society. But why have we determined that this is worthy of putting people in jail for, but all those other things are not, and that a doctor can assist in all those other things. But if a doctor says to you, you know what, I hear you want to gain 15 pounds of muscle, you're perfectly healthy, and I'm going to give you a steroid cycle, that doctor is getting arrested. You know, it's interesting. I, I get into conversations a lot uh, with, with people uh, who are, I guess, all caught up in genetically modified foods and things like that mm -hmm. and usually the people that are very opinionated on this don't actually have a lot of information on it they don't they they watch one video online it's true of most most they, issues they, sadly they <laughs> and you know I, I, I always yeah, I'm gonna get that. Mm -hmm. I always you know have to question at what point are we doing something wrong or at what point are you know our, our, our level of technological advancement um, allowing us to improve to live better lives things like that um, and you know I guess this is kind of similar you know you know I've, I've been told it's like oh you know you're over 40 you go to any doctor they're gonna find that you know you can get TRT shots if you want and I'm like well, you know if I start to and again I wonder how much my own perception has been skewed by everything media wise I've been exposed to the last 20 30 years um, you know, we were talking just a second ago, you know, about cheating and sports, and there's there's an argument that, uh, should, should I say whose it is? If you would like to, I yes. don't know, I don't want to, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it out in case. It's, it, you know, a, 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 friend. a, a friend, you know, we, we discuss all the time. I'm as, holding you know, it for a friend, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> I learned it from watching you, Dad. Um, you know, his argument is that, you know, using using steroids in sports actually makes a more level playing field because in natural bodybuilding, drug-tested bodybuilding, uh, everyone has, you know, genetically determined very, very different levels of testosterone. And if everyone's taking steroids, some kind of performance-enhancing drugs, it kind of, they're all trying to be within a certain range and it actually creates more of a level playing field. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not as an attorney, but just, you know, as someone who's been around the sport as long as you have what do you think? Is that completely ridiculous, or is you know I've heard that argument before, <laughs> and you know um, I don't think it's completely ridiculous at all. Um, but but I could certainly see how you could see it the other way too. The reality is, I think performance in sports is based on a whole lot of different factors. So there's a natural endogenous testosterone factor. There's factors in, in terms of the uh, composition of muscle fibers. If you've got more fast twitch versus slow twitch, you might be better at certain endurance exercises versus, um, you know, explosive exercises. Uh, there's, you know, if you've got, you know, larger feet, you're going to be a better swimmer. I mean, there's all these, you know, height in basketball. I mean, there's a genetic lottery, right? Yes. So uh, it's not fair. It's not fair that, you know, you're five foot two and yet you're the greatest basketball player out there, <laughs> right. but you're not going to get picked up by the NBA. It's just not happening. Right. So, you know, I think there's some inherent unfairness in life and in sports. Um, yes, I guess you could make the argument that by everybody having testosterone levels of 3,000, um, at any given time, you've neutralized, you've now made mm -hmm. that uh, no longer an issue. Of course, all those other issues exist mm -hmm. of, of genetic issues, so you haven't really leveled the playing field. You've <laughs> only leveled one aspect of the playing field, and you've done it in a way that I think most people would feel is socially unacceptable because you, in order to do it, you've, you, you've taken essentially a, um, a pharmacological approach 
an injectable pharmacological approach probably um, that I think there's just a, a, a general distaste for. Mm -hmm. I think it was just a very interesting, uh, you know, proposal because, you know, my initial reaction is that's ridiculous. But then you think about it, and well, I could kind of see the logic there. There is logic. The uh, one counter argument to that, I guess, is what if there is somebody who does not want to take it mm -hmm. for his own moral, ethical, religious, or whatever reasons? Now he is at a disadvantage against everybody else who mm -hmm. has the consensus that we're going to run around, you know, we're going to take three grams of, of testosterone a week um, or, or one gram a week or whatever mm -hmm. we all agree upon. Um, is it fair to him if he wants to stay at the natural level without the chemical enhancement? Right, and I agree with you in that life is unfair. I mean, we could level this playing field and say that, okay, everybody's going to be using this substance at this uh, dose or various substances at these different doses, but it's still going to be unfair because I could take the same drugs that Ronnie Coleman did, and I'm not going to look like Ronnie Coleman. I'm not going. Life is just unfair. And, and that's a great point, too, yes. is that, you know, everybody taking the exact same dosage may not get the exact same results mm -hmm. for a number of genetic reasons, including that there's variations in the response to the drugs themselves. Mm -hmm. So yes. some people may metabolize that drug in a way, for example, where there are more side effects. Let's say a person who's prone to aromatization, at that same dosage, he's got, you know, um, screaming nipples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And somebody else, there, there's a visual, right? Yeah. right. <laughs> somebody else has has a DHT issue, and so he's lost all his hair at that <laughs> at that level, yeah. you know. And somebody else, maybe for whatever reason, all of that, you know, the receptor sites for him are all in the skeletal skeletal muscle. Mm -hmm. So that guy's got this incredible. So now what? To be really fair, does the guy who has less receptors in his skeletal muscle get a higher dosage than the guy who has the, you know, better skeletal receptors? You know, so there's no perfection in this, and, and I get that argument, but these are these are complicated issues. Yeah. Yes, and that can take up a whole uh, discussion in themselves, actually, sure. some of these issues. Uh, but just to go forward uh, with something related to the previous issue is that um, does it uh, steroid use affect others? And that's what you and I have discussed before, actually. Uh, the, there's this notion um, where some people think like this, and we've discussed it before, where, okay, it's my body. What I do with my body is no one else's business. They have that kind of, like I said, for lack of a better word, I think um, infantile view on it. I mean, that to me, that's, that is an infantile view. I mean, we're adults here. Our actions can have large impacts on other people, uh, people that we live with. Uh, people that we don't know, like we were talking about the insurance issue, just on society in general. Now, people will say, like your friend said, Stu, mm -hmm. uh, the, no the, one the whole took, driving issue, right? The yeah. driving issue. No one took testosterone or any other uh, anabolic substance that got behind a uh, wheel of a car and their driving was affected by it. However, we do know some cases of people that went um, and didn't take what we would call a, a modest dose for bodybuilding, not TRT. What we, we some would consider a modest dose for bodybuilding. I'm not talking about TRT here. Is that you know, whether it's, let's say, someone would consider 500 milligrams of testosterone, this beginner dosage is modest, whereas you would consider someone who takes two to three grams per week as going over the top. Right. And once you go over the top, there is a health, con there can be health consequences, and many bodybuilders in the recent past have suffered health consequences from this reckless shotgun approach, especially the ones that we see on Insta um, Instagram or Facebook now, and YouTube especially, right. some of these YouTube celebrities... I mean, they, they have a, a laundry list of substances right. and... And it's not just steroids. It's, yeah. a, it's a, you know, a cornucopia of uh, various things yes. from diuretics to, you know, insulin right. to... So when you mix that whole, you know, pharmacological stew together uh, in massive doses, does it make it more likely that you're going to have adverse medical effects? Sure. You know, absolutely. Um, the argument that it's my body and I can do what I want, um, 
you know, is not something that the law accepts or suicide would be legal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've actually decided that you don't have a right to end your own life legally. You have, you don't have that right. right. Yeah, so, right. I mean, what better way of expressing that it's my body, I can do what I want with it, is not acceptable to, to our laws. Um, on the other hand, there are some, some ironies that some of the things that people do to themselves are perfectly legal but extremely costly to society. You know, we've got a, an epidemic of obesity to you know use a, an, a too frequently used term, but the reality is in some states, obesity is high as almost two thirds. And in many states, it's, it's one third and overweight is, the, is another third. Mm -hmm. So yes. you've got people who are in pre-diabetic pre conditions all over this country um, as a result of poor diet, sedentary lifestyle. These are lifestyle choices. Yes. You're, you're making a choice. I'm going to eat fast food for every meal uh, or I'm going to drink excessive amounts of alcohol or I'm going to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and it's my body and I'll do what I want. Uh, we accept those things. People are allowed to do those things. But those things cost the rest of us who aren't doing those things hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars because those people require medical care that they would not have required if they had made more responsible choices. Right, exactly. And some of them have even rendered themselves, and I see this every day, considering you know the line of work, I'm in healthcare, I'm a dietitian, speaking of obesity and overweight, how it relates to my profession, is that some people, whether it's their drug use, recreational drug use, um, whether it's opioids, that the epidemic that we have now, whether it's uh, food, uh, the abuse of food, some of them have rendered themselves to the point where they're incapable of work. And, right. I mean, morally speaking, I will inject my, some of my morality into this discussion, um, is that do I want a society of people that are not thriving and industrious? Do I? That's not what we really right. consider in our society as admirable or what or honorable so i do think that this affects others meaning that if someone chooses to use anabolics at a dose where it requires dialysis three times per week and considering the expense of that it, it does affect us i mean right. that's my well you, the, the argument would be okay it's perfectly fine for you to do it but if you get sick don't expect insurance to cover. Don't right. expect you've got to cover it out of your own pocket. The right. reality is nobody would have the money to do that, and exactly. so and therein lies the the rub. Um, you know, this brings up, I guess, uh, an issue of how do you deal with drug use in general, uh, whether it's you know sort of the the type of drug use that leads to people not being able to work, and certainly steroids is not typically that right. unless you've really made yourself so sick that you're on daily dialysis or something um, most steroid users are productive they're, yes. they're working in fact the statistics show that they're more gainfully employed than the average American mm -hmm. and and better educated than the average American when you when you you know do the you know surveys so um, so that's not really a problem. And as they say, nobody's knocking over a liquor store mm -hmm. for anabolic steroids. So it's a different problem than more recreational drug use presents. Um, but if we sort of take the, the same approach that other countries are doing with recreational drugs, it is instead of that militaristic drug war that we talked about earlier, it's a harm reduction approach. So you've got European countries now, um, particularly the Scandinavian countries, as well as Portugal, where you know they've sort of stopped fighting the war on drugs. Portugal no longer treats possession of drugs as a crime, uh, and instead takes a harm reduction approach. It takes people who are using this and makes it less likely that they're going to hurt themselves also tries to get them into some sort of a treatment program, figure out what it is that's, that their problem is, um, manage their doses if that's what needs to happen in, in terms of narcotics, getting them back to work. And that's been extremely successful in Portugal. It's ironic. It's sad, really, that we in the United States have heard very little about what happened in Portugal um, and the success of a different approach to, um, to drug use. But 
that concept of harm reduction, I think makes sense for steroids as well. I mean, we talked about demand and supply. I think there's a certain percentage of the human population that, number one, wants to get high and will always get high. And I don't care what laws you make, I don't care what interdiction, you could start all the wars in the world, there's a certain percentage of folks who are gonna wanna get high. And what responsibility does society have to try to reduce the harms associated with that? Likewise, number two, I think there's a certain percentage of the human genome that wants to be jacked. <laughs> and guys who want, and some women, are gonna wanna be jacked no matter what the laws are, no matter what the products that are available, that was the pro-hormone market. That yeah. That's the SARMs market. That's that's what, you know, it's a different motivation than those who want to get, who tune out or, you know, um, get high. It's those who want, for whatever, you know, insecurities or vanities uh, pervade our society, that's what they're going to want to do. And what obligation do we as society have to try to make the, the harms less, to try to reduce the harms to those people and to society? And by criminalizing in a prohibition type style, as I see it, there's an argument that we've actually increased the harms, made things worse than it would have been. Clearly there's a problem. But when the solution to the problem creates a whole bunch of yes. new problems, I think you sometimes have to sit back and say, is there a better way to do this? And I think that applies, frankly, I think there's an argument that it applies both to recreational drugs and in a different way to performance drugs as well. You know, I, it, it's interesting, you know, you're talking about, and I think it's a fascinating, uh, comparing how things, you know, steroid use is, uh, controlled, if I can use the term, mm -hmm. uh, viewed in the United States versus, versus other countries. Um, you had mentioned Thailand earlier, and it made me think back. I remember Dennis James, you know, very popular mm -hmm. bodybuilder in the 90s, you know, one of, one of sure. my personal mm -hmm. favorites, mm -hmm. um, talked about how he moved to Thailand and how, you know, steroids were legal there, mm -hmm. uh, but you couldn't go to the store and buy a jug of protein powder. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, it got me thinking, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, I'll, I'll use the term quality control. Mm -hmm. You know, when things are driven underground, it's, it's a mess. Right. You know, he lived over there, what, 11 months out of the year. He probably came over just for the Olympia. Um, probably had the best quality stuff. The guy was a monster, and you know, <laughs> yeah. he, you know, he, you know, he wasn't sneaking over, you know, the the, the, the border of California to uh, what, right. uh, Tijuana yeah. to right. inject twice right. a week. Right. I lived in California for a while, and uh, I had my buddies. They'd go down, they do twice a week, and come back. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, Tijuana road trip. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, La Farmacia. Yeah, dude, yeah. they they had their little lockers at the border. Really, that was that was okay. Wow. Th these guys played ball for USC, mm -hmm. and yeah. I. Opened my eyes to a lot of stuff yeah. living out there, um, but the possession is in the bloodstream. <laughs> there, there, yeah, not in my pocket. Um, but something else you commented on was interesting. You were talking about the the uh, I guess the statistics. You know, the, the average steroid user, and it's interesting because if you get your information through mainstream media, you, you would think these guys are like hardened criminals. Yeah, you know, yeah. They, they 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 sound horrible, but you don't. You know, the media doesn't report. These are productive members of society. These right. are people with families. These are people right. with six-figure incomes. These are people, you know, it's not, you You think this is some horrible, horrible scum of the earth uh, selling stuff he cooked up in his bathtub right. to, to kids in the back of a gym. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, unfortunately, and that's a whole other discussion, is how the media shapes public perception. Um, and unfortunately, the media has two rules. Make it uh, simple and make it negative. Yeah. So as simplistic as you can make it and as negative as you can make it is what is going to sell papers, put eyeballs on television, get the ears to the radio. If it bleeds, it leads. That's the story at 11. And so it's all super um, completely designed to uh, inflame, enrage, yes. and, and strike fear into the hearts of soccer moms across America. So the picture of steroids that is portrayed in the media almost exclusively has been number one high profile sports stars the you know the Lance Armstrongs the Ben Johnsons the Barry Bonds the Marion Joneses you know these you know sports icons 
So the perception on that level is that if you're an adult and you're using steroids, you're a cheater because you're competing and you're using it for competition. The reality is that's nonsense. 80% of people using steroids, according to most surveys, are not using it for any sort of sports performance whatsoever other than to hit the gym and to look better when they take a shirt off for their new girlfriend. That, mm -hmm. That's pretty much it, um, 80%. Uh, and the other face of steroids that the media portrays are the Taylor Hootons of the world. Oh, yeah. You know, the, 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 father, right? the sad children who, uh, you know, at a tender age uh, take steroids and uh, typically um, either hurt themselves or in some way wind up in the news. And so the media portrays it very often that steroids is a problem because it's teens who are using steroids mostly. I mean, there are, there are articles that would suggest that nobody other than teens are using steroids. And that's also complete nonsense because the majority of people who are using steroids, vast majority, are mature adults, not teens. They're men and women who typically start after the age of 18. The vast, overwhelming majority do not start until after high school age. Um, and many start in their 20s and some in their 30s. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, in the steroid position, uh, as well as in, in positions on other issues, the media shapes the way people see things, and it's often a far cry from the truth. <laughs> you know, it's fake news, so to speak. So, um, so maybe we're getting at least a little bit of clarity for your listeners in this. Right. Mm-hmm. Want to go around here? Or? Well, you've offered a lot of your outlook on much of this, and we were just uh, before we were. Uh, you got you're cooking up something. You two are, are got a paper. Well, yeah, we, got, we got a little you. outline. So, yeah, yeah, I see you. Yeah, I'm so watching we're, you. We're discussing All right. what you got. Well, we we are also going to ask you what your opinion uh, on steroid use is as an attorney versus as someone who's been around professional athletes and bodybuilders. But you've offered us. Yeah, yeah, quite a so lot much. of information. Yeah. That well, thank you. Sorry if I went off script. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> you know, I, just, I jumped. I jumped the, your topic. You know, I no. went outside of the scope of your you, you covered well, the topic, though. I did. Yeah, I did. Exactly. Oh, yes. I, I love if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. And I'm, I'm all ready for you know. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Like, yes. Where is yes. it? Yes. Oh, no, I'm that's good to too. tell you now. If it bleeds, <laughs> come on, I'm here. Kill me. Come here, kill me. What are you doing? It's good to see you. Yeah, everybody's. We should do what you think. Yeah. It's but good, I can, yeah. I can see that de definitely it's super fantastic to meet you. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's pertaining to the media. I mean, it's just what I see these days with all these um, horrible events or outrageous, controversial events. Lately, I, I believe that's what the media does. They sure. uh, no question uh, and leaves a lot, and then you have to go searching online in these obscure websites. You go, wait a minute, I didn't see this before. Right. And some, you know, computer whiz in his basement is piecing together what happened at you know a rally yeah. a car crash and you say mm -hmm. oh they just left this uh left this person out of it they just <laughs> you know they just left this uh yeah. object out of it or they just left this sequence of events out of it and you know with the internet now if you got a brain you could find it on the uh, right. uh but you know you, you have to want to find it you have to want to find it that's that that's the problem for example like you know, with the Ben Johnson um, story that I remember vividly as eight years old, I watched it. It was the first Olympic events I ever watched, right. and I think that him, he, and Carl Lewis were the first Olympians I've ever heard of, actually, right. besides Greg Louganis. And uh -huh. you know, as a kid, and you know, I thought Ben Johnson was this superhuman. He kind of was actually. Sure. Yeah. Well, he was uh, actually literally. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. genetics and effort and work ethic and and uh, Winstrel. Yeah. yeah. But, well, genes and drugs and yeah. effort is what makes. Yeah. Well, it he was just out. an amazing athlete, without question. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's uh, it's funny. Just a, a quick anecdote. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my practice reality is Ben Johnson really did more for my practice than anybody <laughs> yes, because right. I think he was the catalyst right. for the 1990 law that really launched in, in, in the early 90s when I had already been living in the gym culture for many years, yeah. knew a lot of people in bodybuilding, and suddenly now 
steroids were a crime that they had never been before and suddenly people are being arrested and in the gyms no one understood what the heck was going on and on the other side the lawyers the police officers the judges the prosecutors they had no idea what these drugs were about and so I kind of bridged that gap and my practice exploded as probably the only lawyer at that time who really understood you know, had a foot in both worlds and understood both both aspects of it and so to some degree I, I kind of credit Ben Johnson for you know putting you know food on my family's table all these years <laughs> and I did a, uh, a conference um, uh, last year in Toronto and I was on a big panel with a lot of other people who are knowledgeable about anabolic steroid and, and performance drug issues and one of the folks was Ben Johnson and so I got to meet Ben Johnson in person and he doesn't do a lot of appearances and I got to meet him in person and chat with him in person and it was a huge audience of, of folks who were fascinated to, to hear this this you know presentation and I actually publicly thanked him <laughs> for what he had done for my career because you know unfortunately but yes it was a catalyst for a lot of bad things and and I've seen the you know look there are certainly people who have hurt themselves using steroids and we don't want to condone the black market use of anything well, steroids like any drug should be in the hands of physicians who can monitor and examine the, the find the right dosage and look for contraindications that mm -hmm. might indicate that you shouldn't be taking it at all and to tell the 15 year old you should not be taking this and rather than having him go to somebody on the internet who's going to sell it to him because mm -hmm. you know he's going to his money is green so uh we shouldn't you know excuse steroid use or condone black market steroid use as it exists in the non-medical context today um but on the other hand, you know, I've been able to, because of what I do, to, you know, to see the way the laws impact people's lives. And I've seen sort of the other side of it, and that is that where the enforcement of laws against people who may have been using steroids for vanity, for, I mean, you know, vanity, we can find you know have different judgments about you know whether people should be doing things that they do to their bodies but bottom line is some of those people were really not hurting themselves and the law through arresting them giving them criminal records uh, with the collateral consequences that stem from that some of them lost their jobs some of them couldn't feed their families and so lives were ruined not just by the use of steroids, but by the enforcement efforts to stop the use of steroids. Mm -hmm. So there's another side to this that you'll never hear on the mainstream news, that you'll never hear from anybody in government, that you'll never hear from people in the courts. Um, but the reality is that the sometimes the cure is worse than the disease. And I've seen people who really have suffered, uh, good people, you know, uh, I don't necessarily condone what they did, um, particularly if it's a distribution sort of thing. But but many, most of my clients are 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 not bad people, and they've made a choice to break the law, and that's that's on them. Um, but there's a definite distinction between my client base and the client base of the typical criminal defense lawyer. I typically like my clients. Right. That's a great angle. Yeah, it's a great angle, and I, I don't I, think most people consider that at all. Right. I mean, these are some, uh, you know, very um, in, some informative, uh, you know, anecdotes you've given us. And uh, what I would like to say as we conclude is that, you know, the morality and the uh, legal, obviously, morality is in our, as you probably know. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm assuming that our law of, reflects the morality of the people at its make. best it certainly should yes. yes I mean unfortunately I think you know there there become economic reasons behind yeah. many of our laws and yeah. policies and sadly I think if you if you look far enough you'll typically find laws are what they are because somebody's making money on it but but law was intended to be and at its best is based on ethics and morality of what we should do you know the the sort of ten commandments concept of you know uh, the good in life yes
Right. I mean, but what I was saying in, in terms of that is that, you know, you could go online and find these, you know, old uh, advertisements for over-the-counter cocaine uh, drops, uh, heroin, morphine, and these were available to people even for, let's say, toothaches of, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how um, uh, diluted these cocaine tinctures were. I'm sure it wasn't intended to get you high, but I've heard of people using, you know, all sorts of things to cure toothaches, pain generally, and if you think about it, I'm assuming we probably had less of a desire then to divert ourselves with getting high intoxicated and then you have to look at what's causing people to want to get high more why was it that we had these things legal right. and probably less layers of bureaucracy and all right. kinds of people going to prison and what what are we doing wrong now right. I mean, do you, and, do you and laws evolve you know I mean yes. yes they change look at GHB there was a time when you know bodybuilders were using GHB and buying it essentially in health food stores and over the counter mm -hmm. And then, you know, there was a, a girl who claimed that uh, there was a, a date rape situation and she'd been drugged with some GHB. And then President Clinton made a law that, that reclassified GHB as a Schedule One drug. And suddenly everything changed and people were arrested and prosecuted and put into prison for something that was available last month in a health food store. So, um, well, you know, so, you got a fed and they, they flipped on that sure. one twice, I think. Right. Well, well, well what, I, what I think is kind of relates to that also, and then you know, I don't want to go veer too far from the uh, stereo issue, but I think this actually does relate in terms of the morality of drugs in general and law in general is that, well, we have the opioids, uh, um, you know, epidemic now, right? Also, now I see this militaristic attitude towards it, you know, JFK, uh, LaGuardia, you know, we're going to do this there, we're going to do that there, taking this military stance towards it, right? right? Rather than, let's say, like you're saying, more of a rehabilitative stance saying, wait a minute. Why does everybody want to get high all of a sudden? Are they lacking jobs? Is uh, is depression an epidemic right now? Anxiety, etc. Why aren't we taking this proactive stance and saying, wait, why don't we get more social workers out there or psychologists right. out there instead of taking this military guns blazing stance? Do you, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think yeah. you know, mental health in this country has um, you know is is a shame. I mean, it's it's, it's horrific. Uh, so much more needs to be done, and that impacts so many issues, from drugs to guns to many other issues. Um, you know, the the failure of our mental health system to really address people who need attention. Um, you know, yeah, that that certainly you know would potentially diminish the demand for whether it's you know cocaine or or heroin or or opiates. Um, you know, I think that in the opiate issue, not to go too far apart, but I think that there was probably some um, misrepresentation by big pharmaceutical companies as to what the addictive potential was. And I think a lot of doctors were, um, you know, misled into thinking that the risks were far less than they were. And before you know it, things got completely out of control and continue to be out of control. Chris Bell, um, who's the filmmaker who did Bigger, Stronger, Faster, which uh, was a great film, and I was, I was privileged to have been able to work with him throughout that, uh, throughout that project, um, then later made a, a movie about opiates called Prescription Thugs, mm -hmm. and you know, did the sort of a comparison between the harms of steroids and the harms of opiates and made the comment in a number of uh, publicity pieces that his first movie was about steroids, uh, a drug that doctors tell you will kill you um, and you should never use, but are actually fairly safe if used responsibly and under supervision. And his second movie was about opiates, the drugs that the doctors tell you are great and, you, and yes. give to you and, and you can take more of these, but actually they kill you. Yes. Right. Well, do you have any concluding thoughts after all you've said? Because what I particularly like is I think that we, before your personal uh, conclusions, that this is all about context when discussing these things. Right. What would you like to conclude with that? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think in a broader sense, context is everything. And the more as a society now, particularly, that we can look at context uh, to various issues and not take a sort of a polarized view of this is good or this is bad, I think is a good thing. Um, I appreciate this, this interview. I think we covered a lot of great ground. Um, you know, like I said before, uh, 
I love what I do. I, uh, I have the privilege to represent people who um, really need it and need help. And but for my uh, help and assistance in these areas, they might be looking at devastating consequences for themselves and their families. So um, I do have a, a website. Uh, if people need information, they can go to it. It's at steroidlaw.com. Uh, I also have, as, as you mentioned before, I've got an Instagram page, which I just started pretty recently. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. you know, I know that was sort of the potential for it for me, but I did it. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's addictive, Rick. It gets um, sucked right in. And, exactly. uh, and I do have a public Facebook page uh, and a Twitter feed. Yeah. So if people want me, it's Rick Collins ESQ. I'm, I'm easy to find on social media. Uh, and I also have a column in Muscular Development Magazine each month. So I try to keep people updated there and, uh, and keep everybody knowledgeable about what's going on knowledge is power I, I really you know I appreciate this interview and you know it was just a pleasure to speak to you and to offer all this information and uh, you know the eye-opening anecdotes and just the different context you've provided for us as someone who's been involved in bodybuilding for quite some time as well as a an attorney I appreciate the the opportunity, guys. Yes, thank Rick, you so thank much. Thank you so so very much. And and I gotta say, the the Arnold impersonation, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually done it for him. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, the first time I met him at did, the did Arnold, two thousand and two. You know, I'm like, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of this guy. <laughs> I mean, I, I I remember sitting on a school bus when I was in high school, looking through what was then Muscle and Fitness mm -hmm. magazine, and he was on the cover, and Franco was next to him, or you know, and so I was like. I, I got it. So somebody introduced me to him at the Arnold Classic, and I walked up, and uh, he, uh, they're like, Arnold, this is Rick Collins, Rick Collins, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was before he was the governor, of course, and I'm like, it's super fantastic to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, wow, you, do you do an impression of me? I'm like, yeah, I do. You know, it's great. You know, you know. So I, I met him. I once had the opportunity to sit with him in his, in his office in Santa Monica on, on IFBB issues. Um, and uh, just what a success story. What an icon. So I, I love, you know, I'm so, I'm the luckiest kid on the block. I've been able to, to really create a, a career for myself that I'm passionate about, that I enjoy every day, and um, that, that enables me to, to, to meet fun people and, uh, and to hang out with you guys. So thank you again. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, Rick. All right. We hope you enjoyed it and uh, put this information to uh, good use if you, with whatever you do. Knowledge is power. Yes. And if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> yes. Okay, take care. <laughs>